Good morning. Welcome to chapel. Would you guys stand and worship with us today? Enjoy last Monday with Brian Welch. Man, what a great story. Uh, so good to be together with God's people, to hear somebody testify to how great our God is, to find people in the worst of places in life and to transform them like, they, like he has done in Brian's life. 
such a great uh, chapel. I think you're in store for a wonderful time today. Our speaker has become a real favorite around here, Chris Brown. Yeah. He's got a few fans. Uh, for those of you that have never heard Chris, he pastors North Coast Church in Vista, California. Yeah. Um, he and his wife Amy are here this morning. Their daughter is a freshman at GCU this year. So we're really excited. She's a Lope. They are officially in the GCU Lope family. So Chris, Amy, we're glad you guys are here today. Look forward to hearing you speak. So this is the beginning of prayer week. So on your way out of the building today, uh, we're gonna have some flyers for you that'll explain to you a little bit of what we're gonna be doing together as a, as a family of God here on GCU's campus. And if you want to participate with us in prayer, uh, there's a great opportunity for you to engage uh, the Lord, engage one another throughout this week. Beginning tomorrow night, um, we will do a public prayer time together right before the gathering uh, begins. We will meet on that grass lawn between the soccer stadium and the baseball field at 6.30 for uh, group prayer. And if you are committed to uh, this prayer week and you have some time available, please join us there on that lawn for uh, prayer as we uh, begin to launch this unique season of prayer this week, um, beginning in that place uh, at that time. So we'd love to have you there. No Child Hungry Day. On October the 23rd, uh, we are going to do a very special food packing uh, event here in the arena, uh, beginning at 7.30 a.m. That's a Sunday morning. So I know for some of you already have commitments off campus uh, that time of the day or that time of the week. But for those of you that might be interested, we're going to pack food for those who are being affected by the war in the Ukraine. So we would love to have you here. There is an RSVP where you need to register to be a part of that event. Uh, I think it should be, uh, uh, you can see the little, uh, what is that called? The QR code. So log on to the QR code and register for that if you'd like to be a part of that event on October the 23rd. The scripture today is from Psalm 34. And it says this, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Amen. Amen.
praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a heart Hallelujah And I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for my king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy, that's who
we worship you, we magnify you. Lord, there is truly no one like you. There is no one beside you. You are holy, you are worthy. Lord, we give you all of our praise. We give you all the glory. We worship you, King Jesus. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. The old man needs sleep desperately. His, his body's been craving it for about a month. But, but every time he goes to lay down, his worst nightmares flash before his eyes. So once again, he finds himself walking back and forth, the old rickety creaky lumber on the front porch. He will pause on the far side and lay his withered hands on the railing, eyes deep set and darkened by the Middle Eastern sun for, for decades. He will squint, looking, hoping for any sign of life to make its way back over the southeastern hills. There he will close his eyes, one hand stroking his long white beard, and he will pray a simple prayer. Yahweh, bring my boys back home. It's a prayer every parent is praying across the land. To not hear for a day or two may be normal. A week or two, not. Over a month? You know how battles were fought back then. You get two groups of guys, they all run down to the middle. There's a bunch of spearing, poking, hitting, slugging, biting. At the end of the day, you have a winner and there's a loser. So for not to hear a word for months, and all that he has and all that he owns is on that battlefield, his legacy, his namesake, all of his boys. And he will find himself sitting on a stool his heart is telling him one thing, his head the other. And going against his best wishes, he will grab the lad. His brothers call him Ocho. It's, it's not an endearing term. He's number eight of the boys. He's the runt of the litter. He's the one that has nothing going for him, and they all know it. But dad has to know where the men are. So he will grab Ocho. And he will make him a satchel with cheese and bread. He will throw it over his head and shoulder, hang it on his waist. Boy, you go find out if there's anyone still alive. And I'm sure dad added these words. If there's any sign of trouble, drop the bag and just run. <laughs> and little does he know, Ocho will not run from trouble on this day. He will find himself in the middle of it. And God is about to answer prayers of a nation in one of the most unlikeliest of ways, in one of the most unlikeliest of freshmen. And this is the day that's about to turn Israel upside down. It'll start a legacy. You may be familiar with the story. It's one of the most popular in the Bible, but please don't turn it off because you think you know it. There's probably the big four, isn't there? Noah and the ark, Daniel in the lion's den, David and Goliath, Jonah and the whale. And arguably, maybe the most favorite or maybe the most well-known story in the Bible is David and Goliath. It's used in our culture today. March Madness basketball, you're going to find a, a 16 seed, have to play a one seed. An announcer will say, well, today, ladies and gentlemen, it's David versus Goliath. And yet, because we know the story, because it fascinates six-year-olds, it's easy to keep their attention in Sunday school. I think we've forgotten to go back as young adults and read it. It is a mixture of pride and ego and sexuality and lust. It is a mixture of desire, desires, and it's a mixture of a young man who's trying to find his place in the world, and he doesn't quite fit. So maybe watching it with adult eyes today, maybe we'll pick up something new. If you got your own flat screen, the lens of scripture has already taken us into 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're gonna pick it up at verse 20. 1 Samuel 17, 20. Got a Bible? Oh, all right, look on with me. 1 Samuel 17, 20. We, we, we've covered, first of all, it's been 40 days. 
We've covered that the heavyweight champion in the world, been trained since he was a wee little lad, over nine feet tall, weighs scale armor, 125 pounds is just the armor he wears on his chest. They say the tip of his spear weighs 16 pounds. Go to the bowling alley here on campus. What's the largest bowling ball you can get? 16 pounds. That's what this guy just chucks around. He throws it like a dart for a hobby. How far can you throw a bowling ball? And don't go try it. How far can you throw a bowling ball? 10 feet, 15, 20 if you're yoked? This guy is his dartboard. And for 40 days, he's been walking out on the field. Every morning, the Philistines versus God's people, the Israelites. Send me a man! And it echoes. Mono y mano, winner take all. Loser, their army becomes subject, slaves. And for 40 days and for 40 nights, the army of God has been emasculated. The army of God has been left shuddering behind rocks and boulders. For 40 mornings, you get up, you get armed. You think this may be the day we clash. And once again, all he's asking for a man. Who's a real man? And once again, for 40 days, you realize we don't have one. <laughs> we don't have one. And dad has to know if any of his sons are alive. So Ocho enters the valley. <laughs> with cheese and bread. So early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd. He loaded up and he set out just as his father Jesse has directed. And he reached the camp as the army was going out to battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines. They were facing each other. And David left the things with the keeper of the supplies. He ran to the battle lines. He greeted his brothers. And as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And when the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. As he was talking with them, circle, highlight, underline. What were they saying? The Bible fills it in in verse 25. You see, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in all of Israel. Now we have to understand what's been happening the last 40 days. To do that, context, context, context. We gotta go back about six or eight chapel, chapters. It says that King Saul is head and shoulders above the men in Israel. That's right, your king is your biggest man. So for 40 days, when their biggest man comes out and says, send me a man, the whole army looks at King Saul. You're the dude. You got the position, you got the power, you're head and shoulders above everybody. And for 40 days, the king realizes he doesn't have what it takes. Okay, after a few days, that's one thing. After a week, <laughs> hey look, I'll give, I'll give a thousand bucks for anyone that goes out there and takes care of this bozo. Another five days, all right, let's get serious here. $10,000 to anyone that goes out and takes this guy. After three weeks, look, you can have any of my daughters. <laughs> you can become a prince in the kingdom. I mean, how good is that? None of you clowns have a chance of becoming prince. You can get rich and you can be a prince. After four weeks, okay, tax exempt for the rest of your life. Tax exempt. What more can I do? I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to make you tax exempt. And you can marry one of the princesses. And David's sitting there going, seriously? Now get this. For all you know about David, this is the first time he speaks in the Bible. Now I'm not saying that he didn't speak. The first time the Bible writes anything from David is simply this. What is going to be done for the guy who kills Goliath? That's the first time he speaks. Let me take you away from your Sunday school model of what we think of David. Well, I got to color him in Sunday school. I grew up in West Texas, about 20 miles outside in the desert. And we'd go to this little Texas church. And the little teacher had blue hair and she would put up the flannel graph board, this little felt board where all the guys would stick to it. And she would put up Davy. He's a little kid, he wore a white mini skirt. Boys and girls, boys and girls, look, look, listen, listen, look, look, listen, listen. And we'd all look up. This is a man after God's own heart. And I'm like, oh, he wears a skirt. <laughs> and he's a little guy, toothpick arms, toothpick le legs. And boys and girls, look, look, listen, listen. This is what he does. And she'd put a harp in his hand. 
Now, now, and you guys got a phenomenal music school here, so no offense against any harpist, but I didn't grow up wanting to play the harp. I didn't know anybody that played the harp. I grew up when MTV first came online. We stayed at a friend's house waiting for it to come online. And, and by the way, for you guys, it used to be music television. We, for the first time, could see our bands in video. Oh my gosh. Do you know what I never saw on MTV? A harp. <laughs> no one ever got out in the power stance. Bring! You're like, oh God, I gotta get a harp. No, no. He wrote poetry. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. And I'm like, that's, that's written to a chick, right? Nope, nope. That's what he writes to Jesus. And I'm like, oh, oh. The reason why the deer pants for the water in West Texas is because he put a slug into its lungs. You're gonna use the water to field dress them, pack them out, that's what you do. And his weapon of choice was a sling. You don't even have to get close to battle with a sling. You're like, hey, you guys think I hit anything? You know the weapon I wanted? You know the chain with the spiky bowling ball? And this is, boys and girls, boys and girls, look, look, listen, listen. This is a person after God's own heart. And everyone they put on that little board in Sunday school told me, this is what God loves and you're not it. You're not it. Because no one read scripture to me with adult eyes for adults the way it was meant. God says, I'm gonna show you on page one of David's life what is gonna haunt him and his family for the next 38 years chapters watch his motives David asked the men standing near him what is going to be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace from Israel and who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God so they repeated to him a second time what they had been saying and told him this is what's going to be done for the man who kills him now Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men. He burned with anger at him and he asked, why have you come down here? Whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? And he turned away to someone else and brought up the exact same matter and the men answered him exact same way as before. Catch that. Oh, come on, GCU, Lopes, catch that. His own brother comes and says, I know how conceited you are, how wicked your heart is. Now, why would he say that if David's just a man after God's own heart? Because he goes, I know what you've been doing. You're asking for the reward, Ocho. Get back to the little sheep. He's just about the reward. And the Bible puts it in there not once, not twice, but three times. Let me show you biblically, scripturally, what was David's motive that day for going against Goliath? Women and money, I love God, women and money, women and money. You start to become a little bit more like the biblical character now, don't you? That's his motives. Women and money, what's gonna be done for the man who kills it? He brought the same manners before and the men repeated what they'd been telling him. His brother comes in and says, I know how conceited and wicked you are. Why are you out here stirring up trouble asking for reward? And he turned to another group and asked the same question as before. What's gonna be done for the man who kills Goliath? Isn't this great news for you? Huh? I mean, we've got a chapel filled with nothing but just your bunch of hormones. I love God, I wanna love God. Man, I love the opposite sex. I love sexuality. I'm filled with love and lust all at the same time. I'm filled with my own pride, my own passion, my own ego. I want to know how I'm going to get someplace in life, how I'm going to become someone in life. And God says, I'm not trying to hide that. That's who you are. I can use that 
For the next 38 chapters, David is going to struggle with what we were given on page one. Your pride and possessions and your sexuality. Six wives. Well, it's just not enough. So you need to watch some porn on the rooftop. After watching enough porn and going back to her channel again and again, you need to act on it. So once you sleep with the woman next door who's bathing, now you need to cover it up. And the same hand, the same desk that writes 73 of our Psalms now sits down and says, you need to kill my neighbor at battle. No questions asked. Love, Davy, a man after God's own heart. And the nation will hear about their great king. Oh, did you hear what David did? One of his neighbors, one of his generals got killed in battle, left a pregnant wife at home, and our king took her in just to protect her and her baby. What a man after God's own heart. No paternity test needed. Eight wives isn't enough. He has to take 10 concubines. So what do you do when you grow up in a home where dad sleeps with 18 women? Well, the next in line, the crown prince Amnon rapes one of his sisters in the palace. Dad yells at him, but dad really can't do anything about it because the apple doesn't fall far. Absalom, the third son, will become irate that dad won't bring justice. So he'll wait a year and then Absalom will kill his oldest brother for raping his sister. Absalom will live with that bitterness and hatred towards dad for years. And finally, Dad doesn't need to die for me to be king. I'll take the throne. And Absalom takes the throne. And he gets his wise counsel, Ahithophel, around him and says, what should I do my first day in the office? And they have a great plan. You should take all of your dad's wives up on the rooftop and rape them in front of the city. That way everyone knows there's a new man in town. And Absalom says, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And it goes all the way back to David and Goliath that we colored in Sunday school and no one told us what he wrestled with as a young man he is going to wrestle with for the next 38 chapters of his life. And we have a God that says, I know how I made you. I know your desires. I know your temptations. I know you got love and lust and sometimes they all run together. I know you love God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is going to defile the living God? But Ocho also wants to know, how am I gonna get her? You know how it works in a day and age of arranged marriage? My older brother, the next, next, next. I mean, what am I getting? When am I gonna get rich? How am I gonna have success? Man, this is a shortcut to it all. And God said, put it in there once. No, write it twice, write it twice. You know what, put it in there three times. I want every teenager and young adult to know I am a God that created sex and sexuality. I'm a God that created you. I know your motives. I know your desires. I know you love God on one hand. On the other hand, I know it's easy to raise your hand in chapel and I sing hallelujah. And I know what you want those hands to do with him or her Friday night. I know what it is to try to be filled with the spirit in chapel. And yet last Friday night you were filled with other spirits. God says, I know what it looks like to defile a living God. Write it. Tell them, do it my way, and I'll take them and all that they are, and I'll use them for great things. Tell them to pursue it their way. Well, you got the next 38 chapters as an example. And because David has been asking about women and money, (laughs) word gets to the king. Somebody's interested in your reward. So what David said was overheard, reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul replied, you you gotta be kidding me. You're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. He's been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep, which is a lousy resume. Hey, king, king, somebody's asking for the reward. Someone's interested in going after Goliath. And Saul's like, okay, my neck's been on the line for 40 days. Bring him here. So Davy walks up. I've been asking about chicks and bucks. 
And the king's like, you can hear a kid. This guy's the heavyweight champion of the world. You can't go out there. He goes, oh, listen, I watch sheep. <laughs> you watch sheep? That's the lowest profession in Israel. What do you have to do to be qualified to be a shepherd? You have to walk. You have to have eyesight. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. You can watch sheep. You watch sheep? That's a dumb job. That's a no-brainer activity. And David goes, yeah, but let me, let me tell you how goodly I watch sheep. You see, when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it. I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair. I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Hey, hey, listen, listen. It's not just that I watch sheep. I killed a lion once and a bear. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. There's times where I'm out there and the sheep start making noise and a lion came out, grabbed one of them and went back into the brush. Now, if I'm a shepherd, I go, hey, that's one less sheep. That's <laughs> what you do when a lion comes after a sheep. David goes, not me, I ran after it. And when that lion was eating the sheep, I came up behind it and I cracked its skull. Shut up. He goes, no, I got the skin at home. And the second time, I did the same thing with the bear. Now, now, now here's a young man where you're gonna get all caught up in your ego and pride. Let me tell you what I've done. Let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you who I'm in the wilderness. But watch what David does with his past. This Philistine will be like one of them because, circle, highlight, underline, he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Dude, I, I'm gonna admit it. Dude, I'm, I'm just a ball of sexuality right now. I'm a ball of hormones right now. I've got all this pride, I got all this ego. I wanna make something of myself. My first three weeks on campus, I'm looking around trying to figure out how do I match up? Because of the homes that we come from, most of us realize in this auditorium, you don't match up. And David has that. David has his father's voice constantly in his head. Boy, hey Ocho, you're not a leader. You don't have what it takes. This is a waste of money, this education. You're a screw up. See, it came from the last chapter. <clears throat> Samuel took his old Ford 150 down the gravel road to the Flying J Ranch of Jesse. Told the old man with the gray beard on the porch, God told me I can pick a king from one of your boys. Line him up. And Jesse gets all of his boys lined up in the living room. Samuel comes in and looks at Eliab. Mm. Huge strapping dude. Tight end and linebacker. Started his sophomore year on. That's a king. And God said, uh. Came to the next brother. Smart as a whip, dude. Guy can read, study, understands everything. Everything he read, he has in memory. That's, and God says, nope. Nope, nope, nope. He gets to the end of the line and Samuel asks Jesse, I don't, I don't get it. God wanted me to find a king today, but it's not in your sons. But God's never wrong. Are you sure these are all your boys? Is this a dumb question to ask a dad? <laughs> are you sure who your boys are? <clears throat> and Jesse goes, well, I got Ocho but I left him out in the field because you said you were picking leaders. That's not Ocho. And Sammy says, bring him in. Eliab goes out back, hops on the quad, takes off down through the pasture, gets David. He has to sit on the rack, keep his legs above the knobby tires. It takes about 20 minutes to drive him back to the ranch. David comes walking in. And the other brothers got this smirk on their face. Freaking Ocho. And God says, that's my boy. Oh, don't think that didn't sting. Don't think David understands and knows what it's like 
because of what your father has spoken or hasn't spoken into your life, because of the father figure you had or in an auditorium this size, the hundreds of us, the father figure we never had, it has left a void that has told you whatever winning looks like, you're not it. Whatever leadership looks like, it's not you. He's got his older brother that says, I know how conceited you are. I know how wicked you are. You're only stirring up trouble. And part of coming to GCU was just an escape. You know you don't match up. Whatever giftedness, whatever leadership is, you're not invited to the living room. And David refuses to allow criticism to determine his future. Family has spoken that into your life. A father or a mother has spoken that into your life. An older brother who was supposed to be a hero has spoken that into your life. Do not ever let the criticism of family or of man interfere with God's future for you. And David goes, let me tell you what I found. It was hard to be with God in my house. But out in the middle of nowhere, out when no one was around, I walked with a circle, highlight, underline, living God. Twice he has referred to him that way. This is not a religion. This is not a philosophy. It is a living God that the holy creator of the universe still wants to spend time with you. I know you come to chapel because your church is still giving you scholarship if you attend. That's not what Christianity is about. It's not a set of rules. It's not a book of do's and don'ts. Page one and two, God created us to have an amazing relationship with him, an amazing relationship with each other. Page three, we've lost that. From page four on, this book is not everything you have to do to get to God. This book is a rescue mission of everything God has gone through just to get to you. And finding who you are and being able to stand against insurmountable odds is understanding you are not the hero of the story. David is not the hero of First and Second Samuel. He is a tragic character that we are supposed to learn from. And when he takes his sexuality, his pride and ego, and he puts it on the battlefield under the authority of God, God goes, I can do amazing things with a young adult. And you are gonna find in 38 chapters, time and time again, he will take his sexuality and his pride and ego outside of the authority of God, and it will train wreck him, and it will become one of the, if not the, most disastrous, dysfunctional families in all of history. And God said, print it. Don't teach this to first and second graders in the bucket seats in Sunday school. Teach this to teenagers and 20 year olds, young adults who are wrapped up with the world and are wrapped up with the word, and they don't know how to combine this thing, who are trying to find their own place and what am I gonna be and what am I gonna do and they don't know where they fit. And David said, I can look at my past. I'm not gonna claim the lion and the bear. I'm gonna claim a living God who has brought me to this point so far. Wow, what a story. And Saul bought it. And the story ends. So Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. And Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him, a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over his tunic, and he tried walking around because he was not used to them. I, I can't go out in these, he said, because I'm not used to them. And so he took it all off. And he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with the sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. <laughs> I mean, it goes on for 20 more verses. I think you know the end of the story. If not, read it. But I love the way this picture ends before he sets foot on the battlefield. Saul says, okay, you've come here. You step forward. I'm gonna show you what leadership looks like. Here's what you wear. Here's how you move. Here's the weapons you have. Here's the armor you have. Now you at least look like a warrior. And David tried to walk around. Remember, Saul is head and shoulders taller than everyone else. Saul would have the best armor as the king in the entire nation. And David's like, I can't do this. I'm just, I'm just like clunky. And he takes it all off. And he goes, I'm gonna take my sling 
<laughs> and I'm gonna pick five smooth stones. People always question why five, I don't know. At the end of 2 Samuel, it does say that Goliath had four brothers that were also huge. So maybe David's like, I'm gonna take down this clown and if his brothers come, it's just gonna be one after another, maybe. As a West Texas kid, I just think David looked at the battlefield and realized I can get off five shots. I'm gonna have a full clip, that's it. <clears throat> have you ever seen one of these slings? You usually size it for the individual. It's fingertip to fingertip. The type I've used has been made out of paracord before, but back in that day would have been leather. A long leather strip, two circles fastened on the end, a pouch in the middle. David wasn't out there. You can do the helicopter. Or if you're running with it, you do this figure eight that goes around this way and you run in between the blur of the swing as it's it going. And as it comes over your head, you can let it go. And that rock's gonna be at speeds between 115 and 130 miles an hour. It's not a little pebble, by the way. You want something like a good deep sea fishing weight. Something with a little weight to it, something that's smooth so it doesn't curve on you. And David said, this is who I am and what I do. Did you catch this? And chubby guy's starting to sweat already. This is getting good. Let me encourage you. You are made exactly the way you are made for a reason, for a purpose. You are put together exactly the way you are put together for a purpose. And let me promise you, you cannot, will not ever find that purpose on your own. It is impossible. It is impossible for a world of billions of people for you to look into the exact right job, right spot, right location. No, 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 no. You have a God that said, I made you. And I made you to be and do something special. Yes, quirky little you. When they ask for leaders, you might not be called to the, to the room. When they ask for, hey, do you have what it takes? You may have the voice of family or father or mother in your head saying, you're not exactly what we're looking for. But let me promise you, Psalms 139 says, you are knit together in your mother's womb. You are fearfully, you are wonderfully made. The New Testament says you are God's workmanship, that where there's poema, you are God's poem. You are his expression of love. And when you find your giftedness being used by the giver, you are gonna find that sweet spot in life where you experience a living God, not a religion, not a book of do's and don'ts, a living God. And as long as you want to live your life here, defying the living God, let me promise you, you are defying your purpose. You are defying your future. Oh, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> you can be successful in the world today. You can be wildly successful in the world today and still lose your significance and your purpose. I grew up, I was that kid. I was that kid, whether school or church, man, I just was not a fit. My flaming ADHD wouldn't let me study. I can't read things. I can't sit in the classroom. I can't be learned. Well, my brothers were smart. My brothers were talented. My sister was talented. And then there was Chris the family prayer request. Man, I would never shut up. I liked making people laugh. If the teacher was talking, I got jealous. I should be talking. I think I'll say something right now. I had a chair that was constantly outside in the hallway. Even on the football field, the coach would just say, run it off, Brown. And I'm like, dang it. Why am I talking when the coach is in the huddle? And while the team would be practicing, I'd be running around the dust circles of West Texas. I can't draw inside the lines. And almost my entire life, I heard it. Boys and girls, boys and girls, look, look, listen, listen. This is a man after God's own heart. And kid, you don't have a prayer. And no one ever came into my life and said, you know everything that gets you kicked out of class is a spiritual gift? Huh? <laughs> you know every reason your parents put your name up on the prayer request board? is a tool that God wants to use. Do you know the rest of your life, God wants you to be the only one talking in class? <laughs> you're not smart, you're not intellectual, you'll never be called a theologian, but you love telling stories. And you're gonna make a living not telling your stories, but telling his, because his are living. And I hated church, and I hated pastors, 
for very good reasons. That's where I early on encountered abuse. And no one ever told me, you're gonna go to GCU. But simply because they're good at it and they love you, they're gonna try to get you to fit their tunic and their armor and their weapons. Oh, hold on to being you. Oh, get that nursing degree, but please do it differently than the nursing we have in our culture today. Oh, get into that business school, but understand there's a lot of different ways to be a businesswoman, not just what they're showing you. Learn all that you can, but stay true to that part of you that says, but I think I'm different. I think I'm a little off. Get that theology degree, but please don't be the type of pastors we have today. Find what God created you for and realize it doesn't fit. It doesn't look the part. This is what culture says is right. But stop apologizing for how God made you. You lean into a living God that said, I also know what your family thinks. I also know the names that you've been called. I know your reputation from high school. But guess what, honey? That ended three weeks ago. Who you're running with now is gonna be your reputation. How you handle your Goliath now is your resume. Your best preparation to be used by God in the future is simply do what you're doing now, but do it well. Take your no-brainer job like shepherding and be faithful. Take your no-brainer job that's put in front of you, that class that's not even part of your major but just required, and you do it faithfully. Because 2 Chronicles 16, 9 says, the eyes of the living God are searching through GCU, looking for a heart that's simply faithful to him. And he knows, he knows your desire for sexuality. He knows your desire for success. He knows your desire for popularity. He said, print it. Do it my way. And I will use you for greatness. Do it your way. Well, you've got 38 chapters of examples of what happens when I take my pride, my sexuality, my popularity, and I do it my way. The hero of the story has not been, will not be David. Israel, the nation, is in desperate cry for a do-over. And for 17 chapters, no one has leaned in to walking with a living God. And God said, I'm about to enter the scene in the most unlikeliest of students, in the most unlikeliest of ways, simply looking for a heart that says, here's who I am, my future, my education, and my giftedness. I trust you with it more than I trust me. And in my sexuality, and what I drink, and what I smoke, and what I do on and off this campus, I choose not to defile the ranks of the living God. And God says, that's my girl. I've just found my boy. Shouldn't surprise us. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their freshman year, Nebuchadnezzar University, Babylon University, in the cafeteria, they make a pact not to defile themselves in the living God. And God said, I just found my lion's den three chapters from now, five chapters from now. I just found my fiery furnace three chapters from now. It's what you did as a student, not graduation. It's whatever you find yourself doing now, do it well. Lean into a living God who cannot, will not take his hands, his eyes off of you because he made you for a purpose and he desires to use you for that purpose. And you get to walk this planet holding the hand of the creator of the universe. Oh, what a rush. For my daughter that's listening, that's your mom and I's prayer for you. So proud of you. For my nephew that's here, I'll never embarrass Braden by calling him by name. But that's our prayer. Oh, there's a lot of Bradens. I didn't tell you his last name was Bolton. But that's going to be our prayer. And for every single son and daughter that's here. Don't trust God with your eternity. Trust him with your gifts and your future now. 
and walk this earth holding the hand of the creator who in spite of who you are and what you've done still calls you son, daughter, prince, or princess in the kingdom of God, heir to the throne. What a ride. Father, may this chapel take your word and a God that cannot change, has not changed, is still the same today. May we apply it to our life today. May we choose no longer to defile a living God by our actions outside of this chapel. But may we lean into you and our simple jobs like shepherding on campus and around here and find you more than enough. And may you find us, use us for exactly what you created us for. And may we find that sweet spot in your kingdom, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen. This may be a shout that those fragile lungs can't bear. But if we shout long enough, well, the walls might finally fall. Help to lift their hands up in the air But we know that freedom's coming So we'll sing it all